earth itself appeared to me so small that it grieved me to think of our empire, with which we cover but a point, as it were, of its surface. Cicero, the dream of Scipio. Hello again. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. Chapter 40 offers a prelude to the Clavileño adventure. The first thing we note is one of Cervantes' famous narrative interruptions. A third orator narrator intervenes and argues that all who are enjoying this story should give thanks to Cidia Mete, its first author, for his interest in telling us even its quarter notes. So we have another case of extreme mise en abime, whereby we are forced to realize that we are reading a fiction within a second fiction, and that the Duke and the Duchess, who are themselves fictional characters, are performing a kind of fiction internal to all the others. But the narrator's intervention is still more complicated. The term seminima, or quarter note, makes Cervantes' narrative analogous to a musical composition. Next, Cervantes even compares Amete's text to painting. Furthermore, he highlights the novel's extraordinary multifaceted ability to, one, access the interior thoughts of its characters, two, describe things or ideas that might go unspoken, three, reveal the minutia of the material world, four, provide information that can clarify our doubts, five, resolve arguments, and six, address the most subtle points that our curiosity might want to know. He paints thoughts, discloses imagination, attends to details, clarifies concerns, resolves debates. Finally, he manifests the very atoms of our most curious quests. When the narrator praises Amete, O oh celebrated author, he is surely praising Cervantes himself. Finally, he lets it be known that he knows that his art will entertain readers forever into the distant future of mankind for his characters will live infinite epics to the pleasure and general amusement of all who live. This is bold stuff. With an hilarious hyperbole, Sancho laments the fate of Trafaldi and her maidens. Malambruno, couldst thou not have found a genre of punishment to pronounce upon these fallen maidens other than that of their bearding? One of the damsels confirms the severity of the curse. If we are not to be remedied by Don Quixote, then we'll go bearded to our graves. Don Quixote's response is equally hyperbolic. I'd shave my own and in the land of the Moors if I could not remedy yours. The Hidalgo's words also bring back into play the issue of Christians versus Moors. For to shave a man among Moors in, say, Algiers or Tunis would be to mark him as a criminal. Did you know the literary tradition of abusing the trope of Mis and Abim came to Spain via Arabic texts. See, for example, Kalila Edimna, 1251. Trafaldi regains consciousness and specifies what Don Quixote, the liberator of the maidens, must do to lift the spell of their beards. He must ride a magical flying wooden horse to meet the giant Malambruno in Candaya and defeat him in combat. Funny here is Trafaldi's Euclidean precision regarding distances. If one goes by land, it's 5,000 leagues, give or take two. But if one goes by air and by a straight line, it's 3,227. More important is her description of the wooden horse's trajectory of ownership and its relative value. It was fabricated by Merlin, who was always particular, even bourgeois, about who got to use it. He lent him to Pierres, a knight from one of the books of chivalry, but after that, he would not lend it to anyone other than those he loved dearly and those who paid him best. Now, however, Malambruno has stolen it with his arts. Furthermore, Don Quixote will find this horse to be better than many of the mules that populate our novel, a mount that is way better and has fewer problems than those that are rentals. Quixotic Mission How is Don Quixote supposed to reach the Kingdom of Candaya? A. By bribing the governor of Naples B. By dreaming an impossible dream C. By flying atop a wooden horse Correct answer C. By flying atop a wooden horse 
Another curious economic detail appears when Trifaldi describes the wooden horse's magical abilities. Today he's here, tomorrow in France, and the next day in Potosi. The latter being the mine in Peru that provided so much silver to the Spanish Empire. Finally, Sancho comically adds his subjective preference for his own ass. For a smooth and even ride, there's nothing like my gray, even though he doesn't fly through the air. But on land, I'd match him against all the trotters in the world. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating novel. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.